Allora, beh, vedo che qui la puntualità è stata osservata al massimo livello, eh? qui stiamo con i... Allora tutti siamo venuti qua ad ascoltare le due presentazioni. Uh, please God, a long discussion uh, going into all these different issues. Uh, Father Giulio Maspero, who's a kind of, I know him a bit, a little bit, you know, we've been sort of working together for uh, over <laughs> for many years, professor of, um, of theology at this, uh, in uh, the University of the Holy Cross, member of many associations, especially in the area of patristics, the Pontifical Academy of Theology, and he has worked, he did his doctoral work and then a lot of other work, uh, posterior work, on Gregory of Nyssa, Trinitarian theology and the relationship between philosophy and theology, which of course is an inevitable part of decent theology anyway. Eh? I mean, Thomas Aquinas did just that. And um, he's published uh, Trinity and Man with Brill, uh, with uh, Matteo Seco, uh, the Brill Dictionary of Gregory of Nyssa, an important dictionary of the, on, the, on the thought of Gregory of Nyssa, uh, with Ro Wozniak, Robert Wozniak, Rethinking Trinitarian Theology, T.N.T. Clark, and then recent books, on one on the mystery of communion, Encountering the Trinity, a, a text on Trinitarian theology. Um, also, another uh, collection of essays, very interesting, very, uh, very provocative, uh, called After the Pandemic, After Modernity, the relational revolution. So we're into the revelational moment. You know, everything is uh, sort of relation. Let's see how it kind of comes together. So that's published in the States, St. Augustine's Press. And also he has had a lot of dialogue, a lot of relationship, I suppose you could say, uh, with uh, psychologists in this country, especially with sociologists and with philosophers. An interesting book that came out uh, about two years ago, uh, uh, about, uh, three years ago with uh, Pierpaolo Donati, sociologist, and Antonio Malo, philosopher, uh, on uh, social science, philosophy, and theology and dialogue. And also uh, a, um, a professor of, um, with a professor of um, uh, social doctrine and uh, economics, Martin Schlag, uh, after liberalism, a, a work that they came together. So what I want to get to here is that uh, Professor Maspero's, uh, he is very ample, interests, but at the same time, his heart and soul is with Gregory of Nice. I think you can say that, you can't get around that. So, off you go. Thanks a lot, Paul, thanks a lot, everybody. Also, thanks for your silences, Paul, <laughs> not, not just for your words, <laughs> because one of my the best piece of advice is that I received when I was here at the beginning of my studies was just by Paul O'Callaghan who told me, try to develop your own thought. You have to think in, according to your life, what you experience, and that was very, very useful for me. And also it's true that I think from Gregory of Nyssa because it's the first love is always there. And I, I'm not a, a Thomist, I'm a, a Cappadocian, and so I will, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I will try to propose a Cappadocian reading of, of Aquinas, and that could sound terrible, I, I beg your pardon, huh? but I hope that even philologically it could be something there. We, we, we will see, it's just a proposal, and I'm saying this is the, the right re reading of Aquinas, it's just... So, as you see, my perspective is ecumenical as this conference because Khaled and I wanted to, to approach uh, the book on the Trinity from an ecumenical perspective because the Trinity is uh, the reality we, to we belong, so it's the, our common homeland and because of that is the source of unity. So, uh, I want to offer also the perspective of a relational ontology in the line that we develop here in, with the, with this, in this research center we have talked about before. So 
Mm, what I mm, would offer is uh, um, four steps, not three steps. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I couldn't fit everything in three steps. And uh, it's better to divide the question in four articles, I <laughs> think, in this case. So, first of all, I will try to define Trinitarian ontology in, in our views, in what we, we think here. And that, uh, then I will move to the Cappadocians, uh, to Augustine, and uh, then the last step with uh, Aquinas, trying to stress uh, mm, the ecumenical value of uh, the relationship with uh, the Cappadocian and Augustine. So the, f the first step, uh, when I read the book, uh, that is not so um, short, but is very rich, uh, I was struck, first of all, by the title that usually is uh, where you declare your intention. And uh, I discovered that in the book, uh, the title was reflected in a perfect way. Most of all, the idea of nature and mystery together that I liked a lot. And I will try to show why. Uh, first of all, I think that the intention, and you may correct me, uh, Father Thomas Joseph, the, main, the very intention of the book is relational. So he's trying to read Aquinas uh, in relationship with the fathers and in relationship with uh, modern and contemporary theology, uh, judging also the different relationships. That is, is very important. So we have to um, say this is real, this is less real, but the very intention is relational, in my opinion. And uh, I was really surprised by a historical narrative because uh, there are a couple of uh, contributions that are really, in my reading, uh, really new, interesting, and very useful. First of all, the fact that the relationship were re not only by Augustine, but before Augustine by the Cappadocians. And this is a, justifies my approach, uh, this Cappadocian reading of Aquinas. And then uh, the recourse to the psychological analogy, uh, even in the historical narrative, so not just uh, with Augustine, but even before. And I think that these two elements are, are very important. Then I exalted when I read the criticism on the, tri the economical trinity, uh, and Father Sbonino yesterday talked mm, very clearly about this uh, mm, Father White's Gruntaxion, new Gruntaxion. And then uh, I share a lot to the criticism on process theology that I read in the line of, uh, of Augustinism. And because of that also you can see my intention here is to show that uh, a Cappadocian reading of Aquinas can help us to criticize some modern development of Augustine in a secularized way. Uh, this is my, my proposal somehow. So, uh, Father jo Thomas Joseph says that uh, both the Cappadocians and Augustine uh, understood relationships in divinis as non-accidental. This is true, wonderful, and very important. Uh, this is a new, completely new ontological uh, position and uh, due to the <clears throat> relatio subsistence uh, and in the Cappadocian language, the schesis, this is uh, a relational ontology. So my question in this, um, in this paper is, uh, do Augustine and the Cappadocians and Aquinas do this, uh, develop this relational ontology in the same way? Are they doing the same or not? And uh, what can tell us about ecumenism this uh, mm, question. This is what I propose. And because of that, I take three perspectives. The first one is relation in divinis, it's obvious. Then I move to the Holy Spirit and filioque, and this we are, I think we are connected with Isidoros. And then uh, mm, the most important element in Trinitarian ontology is the transition to creation. So reread creation in the light of the Trinity. This is the, the challenge that is very delicate because we cannot project the created dimension into, uh, onto God, but we have to mm, keep the difference, the distance. In the end, I'm commenting on this uh, uh, part of the book. When I read it, I, I got the idea of, okay, let's do, let's take the perspective of Trinitarian ontology in reading this book. And uh, I'm sorry if Father Thomas Joseph, I don't know how he will 
see the result of my attempt, but this is the inspiration of what I did. So when, now we move to uh, Trinitarian ontology, I will try to define it. So it's, it's not obvious to, to talk uh, about uh, Trinitarian ontology, about Aquinas. It could be even per perceived as something uh, challenging or, or wrong. Uh, in, for example, Gilles Marie is clearly against Trinitarian ontology, but we should think uh, which version of Trinitarian ontology. And uh, also Matthew Levering uh, wrote this sentence that, uh, in my opinion, does not correspond to what I call Trinitarian ontology in the Fathers. So it's not a deconstruction of Trinitarian ontology, even if there are a version of Trinitarian ontology that are deconstruction. Because of that also I asked Rowan before that question, that, that final question. And what is very important, in my opinion, what also uh, brought me towards Trinitarian ontology is that in ecumenism, uh, different scholars studied Trinitarian, Trinitarian ontology, developed Trinitarian ontology. We have John Milban, John Izzulat, who passed away very recently. Uh, even in the Thomistic tradition, Norris Clark tried something like that. Uh, uh, I don't want to, to enter into the different flavors of Thomism, but I think that there is something there. And then another uh, interesting remark is that in the Catholic Church, many movements uh, developed or felt the urge to develop a Trinitarian ontology, some sort of Trinitarian ontology. For example, Piero Coda is very well known in Italy and not only. Uh, he belongs to Focolare, Chiara Lubic, and developed a Trinitarian ontology. So this is very interesting. Why? In communion and liberation, you have theologians who develop an ontology of gift, for example, Antonio Lopez. And so you have different people in the Catholic Church who uh, experienced, had an experience of the church in movements who are developing something like that. So my question is why? This is what motivates my my research. So this is my fundamental slide, and I'm sorry for my students who <laughs> always see the same. I can draw just one picture, you know, like <laughs> Le Petit Prince. <laughs> this is my hat <laughs> that is not a hat, and so on. <laughs> so um, if we look at Aristotle and Plato, we have just one ontological level that is finite and eternal. So God and the world belong to the same ontological dimension that is graduated. On the contrary, when we move into revelation for creation, we have a gap. A gap because we have two different uh, ontologies, the Trinity that is eternal and infinite, and the world that is finite and temporal. So this difference is the basis of everything. And because of that, I, I like the gap, <laughs> and I like the tube in London because they always remind me, mind the gap, and say, this is very deep from a theological perspective. I'm the only one, I would say, in London. <laughs> okay. So, uh, nature and mystery, these key words by Father Thomas Joseph, uh, helps me, help me to also mm, read this, because mm, theology of nature is so important because it helps you to keep the difference, to keep the gap. Uh, that started with Athanasius, and uh, Khaled <laughs> knows a lot about his, this. And also, the mystery is founded in uh, this gap because you cannot get to know uh, God uh, by yourself through your intellect as uh, for Aristotle. And so we, we need revelation, we need rela personal relationships, we need history, not in Hegelian sense, but in the gospel sense. So we need the history of salvation, the Father's meaning. And because of that, we need a new epistemology. So we need to discover that the full meaning of the word is only, can be read only in God and uh, in the tri triune God. This means also that theology cannot define God. God is infinite. But on the contrary, we work on the relationship between God and the word. This is what we can really study. And also, we are obliged to develop a Trinitarian ontology. We cannot dodge it because we have incarnation. And Christ is both divine and human at the same time. So you have two natures in Christ. So you have to think of the relationship within these two natures. And also because the, the goal of incarnation is divinization, 
uh, the indwelling of the Trinity in the soul of the just. So this is the, the goal of Aquinas in, in writing the Trinitarian part of the Summa. And, uh, and because of that, also psychological analysis, analogy is so, is so interesting. This is a piece of Trinitarian ontology or relational ontology, my, my perspective. We we'll try to show this. And in a nutshell, um, Trinitarian ontology is required by the connection between economy and immanence. That is the, the key element of theology somehow. So, also in, in Thomism, the Grand Chancellor of this university, um, Professor Ocaris Branya, uh, talking about uh, divinization, uh, he expressed that uh, uh, the act of being uh, in the supernatural dimension changes somehow. Its change is translated from Essia Deum into Essia Patrem in Filio. And, uh, the reason, this is very interesting because uh, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are subsistent relationships. So this somehow obliges you to connect the act of being to the relational dimension in God. You cannot keep separate what is, what is God and his uh, internal dimension, immanent dimension, and, uh, and what is happening to us. It's clear that uh, I'm using ontology not in a Heideggerian sense, but uh, as a, a broader, uh, dimension of metaphysics. Metaphysics is looking at the, the foundation, the first cause of uh, what is of ta physica, so the cosmic dimension. On the contrary, here we are talking about being in general, more in general. Also, we, are, we can say that we are looking at the foundation of ta anthropica, of what is behind the human being, that is ontological denser with respect to the mountains and the stars, because we are closer to God somehow. Okay. Another very important distinction in, in my reading is uh, that when we speak of the ontology of the Trinity, or Trinitarian ontology, we can use the genitive in the objective sense or the subjective sense. So it's quite clear that uh, Augustine, the Cappadocians, and Aquinas share an objective genitive. So they, every theologian has to develop uh, a, on, an ontology of the Trinity. It's, that's theology somehow. Where we have mm, real differences is in, the, is in the subjective genitive. So in how we read the ontology from the Trinity. So how we read the word and the human being, most of all, into, with the light that comes from, from the Trinity. And this is Im impossible to avoid in the Middle Age, and in Italy you can see it very clearly. Because uh, the Middle Age, uh, thanks to the gap, could look at the world as a whole, tried to reread the world, putting God, the Ryan God, in the center. And they had, as Romano Guardini used to say, a Stutzpunkt outside our cosmos, our world. And so, through Revelation, we can look at the whole of creation and treat it as a unity. And you can see, <laughs> A, a depiction of it in the medieval, medieval Italian cities, and not only Italian, where you have the, the cathedral at the center, and all the city is organized around the cathedral. And everything has its uh, position with respect to God. So this is a holistic depiction or portrait of, uh, of, the, of our realities uh, in the light of the Trinity. So my conclusion is that Trinitarian ontology is not by itself a deconstruction, but can be understood as an extension of metaphysics. And also that this extension cannot be avoided in theology. We have to, to do this. And also that Aquinas is a model uh, in this regard because he developed, for example, the relatio subsistence. And, and we will see other details that can help us to uh, to see how powerful what Aquinas did is. It's true that the meaning of a text is always related to the relationship with the context. This seems obvious, but we can forget this. And in the Middle Ages, this is very important because it seems they, those pictures seem different, but uh, also it was related to the fact that I wrote the T in white on a white back background. This is not a reference to Father Thomas Joseph, but <laughs> it's, uh, I'm sorry for this. <laughs> okay. And uh, this means that uh, 
when we talk about ontology, when we talk about metaphysics, we should always consider what's the context of these texts. Huh? And, uh, for example, the five ways can be understood in uh, an Aristotelian context, and we get something a, a priori, because the word is eternal, or we can read them in a, a Christian context, as Aquinas did, and we get something that is related to Aristotle, but is different, because this is a posteriori, because we can follow that path only uh, be because of a gift of uh, the love of God who created. So we cannot do it just with our intellect. We need also to, take, to bring into the picture will, love, and so on. I give an example of this that comes out of a dialogue I had with a professor of the School of Philosophy here. Uh, because this is very famous, the question uh, 29, article 3rd, where um, Aquinas says that God is a person because God is the sum of a perfection. Being a person is a perfection, God is a person. Conclusion. This seems obvious, but it's not obvious from, from the historical point of view because it costed us some centuries to understand that to be person is, to be, is, a, is something perfect. On the contrary, at the beginning, to be pers person, personhood was related to the finitude. And so, for example, Justin says that the Father is not a person because he is God, he's the first cause. Jesus, yes, the Son, yes, because he's the picture, he's the image of the Father. He's, he's circum circumscribed. And also, many problems in subordinationism came out of this problem. So, so we always have to take uh, into the picture the context, the what ontology is there. We, here we have two different ontologies somehow. And Justin and Aquinas don't share completely their background. This is, this is very important. We have to, to consider history and the development of, of ontology. So my first pastoral, pastoral conclusions are, the question of Trinitarian ontology cannot be avoided then. In particular, we can, it cannot be avoided Trinitarian ontology when we talk about the Middle Age and most of all when we talk about Aquinas because the very goal of his construction of his, of his cathedral, cathedral is divinization uh, and all his Trinitarian doctrine is constructed in order to explain divinization. So now we move to the Cappadocian's father and uh, <clears throat> I go Quickly, we don't get into the text, but it's very interesting, in my opinion, to discover, for me, it was very interesting to discover that Arius denied that the Logos could belong to the relatives, to, uh, to relational dimension. And Eusebius, in his dialogue or clash with Marcellus, did, did the same. And it's very interesting to compare these two texts by Eusebius who says that it's impossible that the Logos belongs to, to Taprosti, the relatives, because otherwise uh, it would be similar to a human Logos with uh, uh, the possibility to change with contingency and so on. On the contrary, Gregory of Nyssa in Orazio Catechetti Camagna, not a text for experts, not uh, the confutation, the refusal of Eunomius, but in a text for everyday Christian, uh, says that uh, the Logos belongs to the relatives. Because when you have a word, you have someone who pronounces the word. And so this is a revolution, an ontological revolution. This sentence is, is a very, very new. And in my opinion, everything comes from uh, the exegesis of the prologue of John, where you have two <laughs> metaphysical elements that can be overseen, because it's really, it begins with enarche, and to be in is the hallmark of uh, an accident, because uh, a, an accident needs a substance to inhere in order to, to be. And so the Logos is enarche, had some, <laughs> it was not so easy to, to understand. For us it's obvi obvious, but for them it, it wasn't. And then this very Logos is prostontheon, and proston is similar to prosti. So, what we have is that uh, Eusebius and Arius uh, excluded that the Logos could belong to the relatives, to the, the, the prosti. On the contrary, the Cappadocian explicitly said that the Logos uh, should, could be understood through schesis and because of that belonged to 
the relatives. And behind this, there is the, the presence of Jamblicus Ionomius, where schizes are between substances. I don't go into the details. But uh, in the confrontation between Basil and Ionomius, uh, schizes was very present. And because of that, after Bas Basil's death at the end of 378, uh, the two Gregories developed uh, this theology of schizes, most of all Gregory of Nyssa. And also Ilaria Vigorelli studied the reflex, reflex of this in anthropology in a very interesting monograph. So to answer the Arians and the Eunomians, uh, the Cappadocians had to bring the Logos from between the father and the war as an intermediate step, as a, a platonic eros, bring him into the uh, divine substance and because of that, uh, they use the instrument of schesis to, to do that. And because of that, schesis is within the substance. This is incredible, because an accident, what was an accident, was read within the very substance of God. This is a new, a new metaphysics. And this is present also in Gregory of Nazianzus, who uses schesis. Also, they... Uh, resemantizes, resemantizes, sorry, uh, the post echein uh, that was stoic and also developed into post enai. So they read this relational element uh, in an ontological way. And uh, from uh, here also there is a new reading of the Holy Spirit that was a real problem uh, for the, most of all for the Gregories also for Basil, but for the, the, the Gregory of Nazianzus and Gregory of Nyssa had to prepare everything for the Council of Constantinople. And uh, for example, according to Gregory of Nyssa, and I talk a lot of this with Sarah Kukuli, somehow my friendship with her started talking about the Holy Spirit that is meaningful, I, I would say. Because um, when you read this text uh, in Adversum Macedonianos, the, very, the idea of, of Gregory is that the father is king by nature. And what does the father do? He gives his kingship to the son and through generation, generating him. And that makes of the son not a king, but the king, the one king that is God. So mm, the son is the only one divine nature. And the Holy Spirit is the kingship. So... The father and the, and the son are king, the same king, because the father gives the kingship to the son, and the son gives back the kingship to the, to the father. That's incredible. Also, that's very close to a sort, not a filioque, but a sort of filioque, because to answer the pneumatomachians, they had somehow to bring the Holy Spirit between the father and the son without violating the monarchy. And in this way, you can do it. And it's incredible, in, in my opinion. So they brought the pneuma uh, into the divine substance too, again, using some terms that were related to relationship, kinship in this case. Another version that is wonderful is uh, uh, glory. The father gives glory to the son, and the son gives back that glory that is uh, the being of God, this is very biblical, because the kabod is not uh, aesthetical glory, it is uh, the, the being of God. The son gives back this glory to the father. And uh, the unity of mankind comes from this glory that is given to the apostles and through the apostles to everybody. So here we can see that the Holy Spirit is, re is read in a relational perspective. And this is what... Uh, make it possible, make, made it possible to Gregory of Nyssa to move towards creation. Mm. And in this sense, uh, the internal, the national, the relational dimension of the triune God is, can be read from this perspective as the foundation of the relational dimension in, in the mankind and the world somehow. In, uh, in, in the Omnium Pificius, we have also a psychological analogy that is not so well known, but is present. And uh, we have something similar, even more precise and developed, in Gregory of Nazianzus. I'm sorry, because even in 
the translation of Sous Chrétien, uh, the, the translation somehow uh, hides this psychological analogy that is pretty clear in my opinion because we, we have that the characteristic of the father is to be without beginning, the characteristic of the, of the son is to be generated, the generation, the Holy Spirit procession, as in us, the mind, thought, and spirit. So it's uh, an intentional parallelism. And it's clear, Gregory of Nazianzo, so it's not Augustine, <laughs> it's, it's different. But what is behind this, in my opinion, is this relational grammar, this relational uh, understanding of the Trinity that made it, makes it possible to reread the world and the human being, the immanence of the human being in a Trinitarian way. Sorry for advertising my book, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not Irish, but I'm similar. My region is Celtic too. So if you want to read more about this, there is a book coming out just in July. And another one for CUP coming out in September, I, I, would, I, would, I guess, I hope. So in Gregory of Nyssa, we have a strange reading, a very original reading of, the, of human nature, because, because he says that um, we we make a mistake when we call man in the plural, because there is just one man that is the human nature. And uh, why in Adablabius uh, Gregory does that and in other texts? Because he also brought the relationship inside within the human nature. So in this case, there is no identification between uh, the relations and the one substance uh, as for God, because in God, each relationship is the substance. In this case, it's no, it's a part of the substance. But it's very interesting to reread these relationships as something that is not just accidental, but is part of this being, also in its historical dimension. Because my, I started studying the theology of history of Gregory Nyssa, and somehow I, I'm still doing the same. I'm just deepening what I discovered in my doctorate. And this text is, is wonderful, the Omnis Opificio, because he connects the unity of the human being with the unity of God, commenting on Genesis 1, 27. And uh, we can see that the relational structure of the human being, of mankind, is founded in, in the Trinity. And also, this is a mystical text, uh, where he says that um, the Father loves the Son uh, with the same love that uh, with them, with, with which he loves us because we are the body of Christ. So that this unity of the Trinity is really given also to us uh, through the love of, of the Father. So the, the love, divine love is Trinitarian in his reading. So my second partial conclusions are that the Cappadocian developed a Trinitarian ontology that is a relational ontology because of what I said. In this relational ontology, there is no position between relations and substances. Just on the contrary, relations are, are brought into the substances. And uh, because of that, the Holy Spirit is, can be read as the relationship between the Father and the Son. And this is important because now we, we switch to Augustine. This is not the love of the Father and the Son. This is the relationship. So the, the terms used by Gregory are biblical, glory, kinship. So he's speaking uh, the language of God. He's not using anthropological terms. This is very important for what I'm going to say. And also because of that, this applies both to divine nature and to uh, the human nature. And because of that, we have both the objective genitive of Trinitarian ontology and the subjective geni genitive. We switch to, to Augustine in, in this way because mm, I, as a Catholic, I read um, Augustine before, so I was educated with Augustine. Then I started studying the, the Greek fathers, and most of all Gregory of Nyssa and the Cappadocian. And I could understand why my Orthodox friends said some things about Augustine. Huh? Uh, for example, that he's not apophatic, that he projects an anthropology into the, the Trinity. I was shocked because if you read the, the Trinitate, you see that he's very, <laughs> he's very apophatic, and he stressed this is not a demonstration of, uh, of the Trinity. So I couldn't understand why. But then I was challenged by Richard Cross uh, writing that book. <laughs> he told me, yeah, you should add an, a chapter on, with a comparison between Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine. 
And I said, oh, I cannot do that. It's a scene in Italy. In, a, in our school of patrology, you cannot compare. You have one father, no, not one father is too much. One period, one father, no, one period is too much. You, one sentence of one, or, sorry, sorry for doing this. So I said, okay, to publish the book, I have to do that. And I did that. And it was really a real blessing, in my opinion, because rereading Augustine after the Cappadocians, I said, wow, now I see, now I see why. Now I see why uh, the Eastern reader, reading can be shocked by some sentences of Augustine. And everything is related to the metaphysical poverty of Augustine, who is a Western. He has maybe Marcianus Capella, he, he, he doesn't have Plotinus, uh, Porphyrius, uh, uh, Alexander of Rhodesius, these giants in metaphysics. So he's more linguistic. And uh, you can see this because in Augustine you don't see emerging of schizis and usia, but uh, you see that uh, the relativo, not relatio, relativo is what Augustine uses, uh, following on Marciano Capella, uh, the relativum is just juxtap juxtaposed to the substance. So you have two co-principles somehow. You have the substance and relativum together. Huh? You don't have uh, a metaphysical view of the schesis within the substance. This is my, my reading, I uh, open to. You can see that uh, Augustine follow, these texts are very famous, are present in the, in also in, in the book. Ad aliquid is prosti, exactly. A relativum is schesis, so the, there is a perfect correspondence. Uh, this is a very famous text, so we specifically affirm that whether attribute is predicated of that divine sublimity, in an absolute sense, I'd say, is said in a substantial sense, substantiality. Whereas when it's predicated in relation to something else, ad aliquid, it's not said in a substantial sense, but in a relative sense, relative. This explains why is more linguistic. I'm not saying that he's just linguistic, but that his approach is linguistic. And in this text, um, where he discusses the names of the three divine persons, it's quite apparent that he cannot have recourse to this presence of relationships within the substance. And so he keeps to the, the distant names, to generic specific names. He's not able to do what uh, the Cappadocians did, uh, speaking about the relational identities of the three divine persons. Because the very work on the Holy Spirit was an attempt to present the three names of the divine persons as correlative. So to, to express not just the Father in relation with the Son, but the Father in relationship with the, the Son and the Holy Spirit, that is the kingship that make the, the Son, King, and so on, the glory. And, and vice versa, because they had in front of them the, the pneumachromachians. Uh, here comes one problem seen from the East, in my opinion. Because you can read the relationship between the Father and the Son as closed. And Filioquis, for example, Anselm, uh, in Italy we say of Aosta, around the world of Canterbury, huh? uh, <laughs> The, the version of Filioque of Anselm comes from here, somehow, comes from Augustine, and it's, cl it's clear. And um, also, for example, the the, we can compare these two texts. The first one, uh, the one who is born of the father when he is called son, says relationship only to the father, not to the Holy Spirit too, huh? uh, and so on. What, how does Augustine recover this relational dimension of the Holy Spirit through the charity, through, through love, through a sort of anthropological uh, term, uh, saying that uh, mm, the Holy Spirit is the caritas, the, the charity with which the Father loves the Son and vice versa. So the theology is the same, but the language is mm, poorer somehow and has shortcomings that in the the developments of, uh, of theology came out. Also, this is something uh, wonderful, this is a strong point in, uh, in, in Augustine. He speaks of the Holy Spirit as the uh, ineffable hug of uh, the Father and the Son. That's one of, that's very anthropological, huh? but it's, it's beautiful because you see that the word is the overflowing of this joy 
of this, this love, of these uh, feelings even, of the Father, the Son, into brackets, everything. Huh? So you can read very easily the word, the created word, in the light of the Trinity. But also, they are connected through a language that is too anthropological. So it is not metaphysical somehow. It's not too purely ontological. And this make, makes it possible to go to the psychological analogy where re, re, relative dimensions of uh, the faculties, human faculties, are key elements. So, um, okay, this is where both uh, the Holy Spirit and the psychological analogy gets in, get into the picture. So my conclusion is that August, August, uh, Augustine, Augustine resemantized the relation but not the substance. This is what I, I propose. Then, this made it possible to reread creation easily in the light of Trion God, uh, but maybe kept them too, too close. And there is a risk uh, from an ecumenical perspective uh, because the, the relationship between the Father and the Son can be read as closed in the Filioque, and also we, res we resort to anthropological elements to present the immanence of God. Also, I wrote there the gift because when we read Augustine, the Holy Spirit is not the gift that the Father gives the Son, but uh, is the common gift of the Father and the Son. And this is a very deep difference with respect to Aquinas, because in Aquinas, the Holy Spirit is love as gift given by the Father to the Son and back from the Son to, to the Father. So we get to, to Aquinas, and I'm going to my conclusion. So from the very beginning, Aquinas introduced the relatio subsistence. I was convinced that uh, the relatio subsistence was a result of all his life. It isn't so. It's incredible. In the, in the doctoral thesis of Aquinas, everything is there. Maybe Albert uh, the Great is present, the commentary of Pseudo Dionysius. But the idea of relatio subsistence is the starting point of, uh, uh, of Aquinas Trinitarian theology. This is very powerful. And this means that uh, a relatio subsistence, a Trinitarian ontology in the objective sense is uh, very present, is uh, the key element, the basis. I don't know if there is a mediation of uh, John of Damascus too. Um, it's probable that uh, uh, Aquinas had read uh, Gregory von Azianzus, uh, the theological orations, there were translations, we will know more, I think, than in Lutheran, Lutheran, they are working on the library, we will see. But what is, what is very interesting is that we keep uh, this um, Trinitarian ontology, this relational reading of the immanence of the triune God from the Cappadocian to John of Damascus. Also because of that, I, I don't agree with Johannes Zerhuber and his last, latest book. Okay. Uh, we see how important uh, was John of Damascus in this text uh, of Distinctio the, the two, uh, where his relation has ratio, the differences between the divine person are uh, secundum rationem, and Aquinas says no, the, in this case ratio should be read relatio. This shift is uh, incredible, is very, very powerful. And also uh, this uh, other text in Distinctio 26, uh, where he says that abstracta relazione proprio eloquendo in, in Deo nil manet, uh, is incredible, because uh, Neque essentia manet, if we take relationships away from God. So everything is relational in God, within God. This is very powerful. Both the personal dimension and the substantial dimension. I cannot imagine Augustine writing something like that, according to what I read in the Trinitate. So my conclusion is that uh, Aquinas is closer, closer to the Cappadocians when we look at Trinitarian ontology and relational ontology. And because of that also, um, he criticized so strongly both Richard and Savitor and Anselm for introducing necessary causes, reasons uh, in their Trinitarian theology, because both of them were very close to Augustine somehow. Even if we look at the Holy Spirit as a gift, uh, not between the Father and the Son, but a common gift of the Father and the Son, we understand the condilectus of Richard of St. Victor's very, very easily. In this text, we see how Aquinas is quoting the Trinitate 15, uh, but according to Aquinas, love as the nature of the first gift from which all free gifts come, 
And this love proceed, proceed as gifts from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the Father. So here we have an identification of gift and love that is closer to what Gregory of Nyssa did. I'm not saying that, uh, okay, Gregory of Nyssa said everything. He's the best in the history. Even Aquinas copied him. I, I'm not saying this, sorry. <laughs> I don't like this approach. But just, I think that the perspective it can be useful to see that Aquinas can be read in a way that avoids some misunderstanding in ecumenism. This is my only goal uh, in, in, this, in this presentation. Also, I think that it's very interesting to bring into the picture uh, the conversion into brackets of Aquinas about, uh, the, about the name verbum that uh, in uh, the doctoral thesis, in the commentary of the sentences, was understood both in notional and essential sense, but uh, that between uh, 1269 and 1271 uh, was declared Mm, so the, the idea that verbum could be also an essential name was declared heretic and not, uh, not close to the fathers and, and Augustine. And we have in the Summa the affirmation that verbum is only notional. Uh, why is this so interesting? It could be also connected to John of Damascus. Because if a verbum is not uh, also an essential name, that means that we cannot express the substance. <laughs> the, the, su the substance is not expressible by itself. To understand uh, not only God, but also creation, we have to go into God in uh, the generation of the Son, because uh, creation itself is the prolongation of, of the generation. And this, here come the missions as the key element also of T.J. White's book. I bring uh, again uh, um, John of Damascus into the discourse because uh, when you, we read uh, his defense of the icons, through this relational approach, uh, through the Cappadocian theology, he's creating a connection that is wonderful, this Trinitarian ontology, this is clearly Trinitarian ontology because he says that we have six levels of uh, image. The uh, connatural image, who are the Son and the Spirit alone. Then we have divine wisdom, that is an image of God, somehow in God for creation. Then we have the human being created in the image of God. So we, we go from within God, God outside God, and we see that something is kept, something is different. So we have a relational dimension, because a relation is something that is identical and different at the same time for the same reason. And this is very powerful. Then he goes to Holy Scripture as an image of God. I don't know if some exegetes agree, or this is my faculty. And then we have the topological connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament as an image of God. And this is the key element of patristic exegesis. And then we have representation of events, both in a narrative form and in the icons. In this way, John of Damascus founds uh, the, uh, the worship, uh, or no, sorry, the, the, the cult of uh, the icons. And when we read what Aquinas did uh, about the definition of persons, of a, of a person, we see something similar because he's looking at a concept, a definition that can be applied both to the world, to the human being, and to God. Because uh, Buizio's definition was good just for the world, because persona is substantia, on, but in God we cannot have three substantia. Richard of San Victor uh, developed a very good definition for God, but wasn't uh, good for the human being. On the contrary, subsistence, irrazioni natura, is perfect both for the human being, the angel, and, and God. So this is a perfect exercise of theology. When we develop some language that can be applied to the word and God, keeping the differences without confusion. And so my mm, partial conclusion are that, no, this is not so partial, almost final. <laughs> Aquinas Trinitarian ontology seems closer to the Cappadocian than to Augustine if we look at him from the relational perspective. The spirit is love as the gift that the father gives the son and so on, and vice versa. And ecumenically, this makes Thomas more attractive <laughs> somehow if one reads the, his thought from the Cappadocian tradition. This is my, 
my, mm, my guess. So somehow I try to take seriously this uh, uh, sentence in uh, this paragraph in the conclusions uh, of uh, uh, Father Thomas Joseph's book and also to stress how um, contemporary theology and contempor a modern philosophy somehow uh, are not able to catch something of Augustine, the Cappadocians, and the good theology, because they um, read Augustine in a secularized way, and we got uh, idealism and so on, and we have problems because the context is bad somehow. So you, we have an ontological architect architect architecture that doesn't work for revelation. This is the problem. We are not against contemporary theology. I'm not against, uh, I don't know, uh, existence vice uh, and things like that. Just they are not good for what we want to do if we want to present the human being in the light of the triune God. And this is the last slide, so sorry for being so long. So uh, if we take the perspective of Trinitarian ontology and this relational ontology, both in the objective and subjective genitive, uh, we can appreciate Mm, mm, Father White's book even more, in my opinion. This is my, what I propose. Because in his narrative, uh, he recognizes re-semantization re of relations already in the Cappadocians before Augustine, and because of that, of, he recognizes the importance uh, of psychological analogies, uh, analogy, even in, uh, uh, before Augustine. And this raises the question of Aquinas' proximity to the Greek fathers. Uh, the final step is that Augustinian theology is supposed to misunderstand this at the ecumenical level because of the difference in this is con conceptual relation with respect to the Greeks. And I understand why the filioque was criticized. I understand why uh, there were accusation of, pro of a projection of anthropology into the divine. Uh, immanence. But maybe we can read Aquinas in this perspective also, and uh, we can see how Aquinas himself, with his Greekness, sorry for the term, can help ecumenism even more if we read Aquinas from this perspective of relational or Trinitarian ontology. And that's all for, for sorry for my passion. <laughs> So thank you very much, Professor Maspero. Uh, but, I mean, there's no point in me trying to add on anything here because a lot has been said, eh? a lot of things have been said, no? And I think it's interesting that the, the issue arose this morning of the relationship of Thomas with uh, Aristotle and Plato. Uh, and of course, uh, the, there's a, an issue there which uh, all uh, thinkers, Gregory and Augustine also, they fought with it and they had to battle with it. But anyway, I think a lot of things will come out of this uh, discussion, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the, the questions and the observations that will be made. Um, did you have anything else to add? No? No? You have, you have enough? No. Maybe if someone has some specific question specific about the presentation, sort of they can be asked now. Otherwise, we can move to Isidoro's presentation. Because after Isidorus, we have a, a, a confrontation, we can discuss, we can uh, fight, we cool. can do... No, there is a real dialogue after, after that, and I think that it's worth... Ryan. So in what sense is Trinitarian ontology an extension of metaphysics? For Aristotle, metaphysics was conceived as the most general of sciences because it addressed the topic of being qua being. Now, as late as Francisco Suarez and then with the successors of Leibniz, ontology was framed as a more general way of approaching the subject that wasn't concerned with the specific objects of God, the world, and the soul, but rather concerned being and its relations. And I take it that Trinitarian ontology is in some sense an ironic reappropriation of this Leibnizian notion of ontology that is 
always related up and beyond and from the imminent relations of the Trinity. Now, does this mean then that it is more general and more extensive in scope than classical metaphysics from Aristotle onward? And is it more extensive in scope precisely because it is always related as proceeding from the imminent relations of the Trinity? So th thanks for, for the question. Mm, my point is that uh, mm, when we introduce the gap, we also create a difference between language and uh, being, because in Aristotle and Plato, you have a coincidence between being and intelligible. On the contrary, when you move to the, to the fathers, um, most of all, I would say, after ori with origin, is something is happening that is really strong. Uh, you have that to be doesn't coincide to be intelligible because the intelligibility of being is full only, fully only in God. So I'm not saying that there is no conversion between the universals, but I'm saying that um, the being itself can be understood only really, perfectly, fully from within God through the Logos. And this is something completely new because of that apophaticism is maybe the real epistemology of theology. So we, we need to keep a distinction between being and being knowable. So oh, in another, another way, the, the question could be intelligible by whom? Not by the human being, by the human intellect by itself, but through a relationship with uh, God himself uh, in the Son. I don't know if I answer your question, but this is... As for you, one specific question uh, came up in the discussion of, of Augustine and his, um, the fact that he does not successfully modify the concept of substance, that he, he rethinks relation, but substance from, it's, doesn't take relation inside. I wonder, does, does that happen to a certain extent when his consideration of created things? Um, because as I think there's one of the slides where it points out that he's very sensitive to the Trinitarian um, reflections in creation. The psychological mm -hmm. analogy itself is a reflection of how the Trinity is mm -hmm. manifest there. And so uh, I, do you see a way in which maybe there's a kind of relational ontology going on within creation, even if it's not as profoundly carried out within the Trinity? Well, what, what a question. Uh, <laughs> I think that... Uh, the problem with Augustine is uh, about metaphysics, so the, the tools, the ontological tools that he is working with. This poverty somehow makes it easier to read the word in the, in the light of the Trinity. So it, there is a Trinitarian ontology in the objective sense and in the subjective sense in, in Augustine. This is wonderful, but also somehow is the basis of what Hegel did somehow, because if you if the gap is not ontological, clearly ontological, and only gnosiological, non only at the level of knowledge, uh, you can do what Descartes did somehow. So I, I am because I think it could be read from the mm, perspective of knowledge, but then in the end it becomes ontological. So I am what I think. This is the, the shift that uh, so we, we cannot read uh, modern philosophy and postmodern philosophy without Augustine. He's so influential. But at the same time, I think that the Greek correction could be very interesting to, to keep uh, the difference between objective and subjective uh, Trinitarian ontology. Because if we mix them, it's very dangerous. You can get millions of dead people because of that, millions of killings out of that confusion. Theology is very important. 